All right, welcome, and uh, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This comes from the end of uh, Genesis chapter 2. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Catherine of Siena, I pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So after a brief introduction last week into sacred scripture, as well as into the book of Genesis, uh, we're actually going to dwell into the text today. And really, Genesis is 50 chapters, but we're only going to look at the first two chapters. And so before you panic and say, oh my goodness, there's going to be 25 more of these. No, we're going to, it's eventually going to get longer. We're going to cover more ground, uh, you know, as, as we move, move along here. Can someone open the door in the back? There's people trying to get in the middle doors there. Hal, if you want to thank you very much. So they're going to try all the, poor people are going to try all the doors here. And um, just, be, yeah, before they walk around the building here, the people... People watching this on the internet are being like, you know, what's he talking about here? But, uh, but anyways, and so we're going to look at the first two chapters, which deals with uh, Genesis uh, 1 and 2. That is the story of creation. If we just look at the structure there on your second slide, so I know some of you have the paper version. You can also look up here. Um, really, Genesis is broken into, Marcy, you got the PowerPoint up yet? Okay, so we're going to get the PowerPoint here. Get that up. Okay. Okay. So Genesis, all 50 chapters can pretty much be broken into two general parts. Um, the first 11 chapters deals with pre, uh, primeval uh, history, uh, which deals with the origin of humanity. And then from chapters 12 to 50, it's going to be the patriarchal history which is going to look at the origins of Israel. So remember last week I said that the book of Genesis is like the prologue for the Pentateuch, okay? The Pentateuch is what those first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, Genesis serves as the prologue, Deuteronomy serves as the epilogue, and the central component, the central book really in those five books is the third one, Leviticus, because it's a book about worship, okay? And the, the, really the main purpose of those five books is about Israel and the right and true worship of God. Okay, so Genesis is going to set the stage. And we're going to start with creation. Then when you look at those first 11 chapters, okay, we're going to see that you can break those up into two smaller parts. The first five chapters is going to deal with Adam and his sons. And then from 6 to 11, it's going to be Noah and his sons. Very interesting. When we look at the story of Noah, try to remember some of the key things in the story with Adam. You're going to see some key themes and also key words and phrases that are going to be repeated when we go into the story of Noah and his sons. And there's a reason for that. Okay, more on that down the road. Actually, it will be... Uh, two weeks from now. Next week, we're going to look at the fall and the events leading up to Noah, and then we're going to look at Noah to the Tower of Babel, and then the last about three or four sessions is going to deal with the patriarchal history. We have to, uh, though, address, uh, address this question right off the bat, um, and that is this. How can the six-day creation story be viewed in light of modern science? So, there's actually two creation stories. And we'll talk more about that in the next slide or two. But the first creation account is the one that you, if you go to the Easter Vigil Mass, that Saturday night mass that's very long, okay? That first reading from the Old Testament is from Genesis chapter one, and you get the whole, the whole chapter, and then some, okay? And 
you're just wondering, you're, I guess, thanking God that there's only six days, okay, or seven days in a week, right, uh, instead of more. But you, you go out there, and you, you will hear people on the internet, um, Christians who are very devout, um, very devout in their, uh, in their faith and in their study of Scripture. Uh, and what are they going to do? They're going to argue for a, a six-day creation, that everything, everything was created in six days. So a lot of people will believe in that, and then a lot of people will argue and say, well, no, the, the Bible is false. Science proves that it's false, that creation uh, and the origins of the universe uh, happens really over probably billions of years. You know, um, where you got like the, the history of the human person is like very small compared to like the rest of the age of the universe, at least according to scientists. And so the major question that needs to be asked is, is well, how, how do we reconcile? And the answer, um, maybe put simply, is this. Like I said last week in the study of sacred scripture, it's very important to know where the writer of these books are coming from. What's their culture? What's their genre? Okay. What's their intentions? Okay. What is their intentions in writing this book? And at the same time, on the flip side, when we look at the scientists, and the scientists, and there's a lot of brilliant ones out there, and they do great work, but what happens is, is that in their study of science, they become theologians and they become philosophers, and unfortunately, they're often very bad at theology and bad at philosophy. They take their study of science and they make claims according to the science, but then they start making, without knowing it, philosophical statements that necessarily do not follow. They won't follow, it's impossible follow from what they're talking about in their respected field of science, whether it's astronomy, physics, biology, chemistry, whatever it is. You know, so you have a chemist, and they studied chemistry, and they talk about, you know, the things of chemistry, but then they make a leap out of chemistry into philosophy. You know, so an astronomer might tell you about the origins of the universe and talk about all the components that make up the universe, but then they leave astronomy and they make a philosophical statement. God doesn't exist. But the data from their astronomy does not prove or disprove, you know, the existence of God. Does that make sense? You know, it makes sense. So someone like Carl Sagan, a very brilliant mind, but unfortunately not a very good philosopher. Okay. And likewise, philosoph you know, Theologians and philosoph you know, people studying philosophy, that is, will make statements, again, in the text, and then make scientific sta uh, statements. They leave the realm of their science into the physical science. Is that the intention of the author in this book, to give us a very detailed account of these creation stories? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really uh, take a guess and say, well, no. No, that's not the purpose. And I'll show you what the purpose, in just a moment here, I'll show you what the purpose of these two creation stories serve. When we look at a Near Eastern creation story, okay, a creation story that existed during the time of Genesis, it might have some similar themes for Genesis, but also very, though, a very different, a very different message. Let me see if that's coming up next. Yep, that's our very next, uh, very next thing here. So, the Inu, In, Inuma Elish, okay? It's an ancient Near East text about, about creation, okay? Maybe it was from the Hittites. Maybe it was from the Sumerians, okay? I, but here, here's their creation story, okay? And I broke it up into four parts here. The creation of the world is the unintended consequence of a battle among gods. Unintended consequence. Battle amongst gods. Think about that. Think of how it's different 
from Genesis, different from the text we're going to look at in just a moment. Unintended. In Genesis 1, it really it begins with what? God speaks. Very direct, very intended. Point two, uh, Tiamat, the goddess of the depths of the sea, loses a battle to Marduk, the patron god of Babylon, okay? So this is probably a Sumerian text, all right? And the creation of the universe has formed from her corpse, okay? Very interesting. Tiamat's husband, Kengu, is also slain, and from his blood, humans are formed. Four, humans are slaves to the gods, <laughs> exist to perform menial tasks for the gods. Sometimes I think that is true. <laughs> Boy, but notice how different. Wait, wait till you see when we look at Genesis 1 and 2. We're going to see a picture of the human person, and it's going to be almost just the complete opposite of this idea of being a slave to the gods. No, this text, this text from our founding fathers, this text from our fathers, is going to present a very different picture of the human person and of creation. And so let's look at the artist, okay? That's what I want to call him an artist, because when you look at, this is Genesis chapter 1 now, when you look at how this is done, okay? So let's look at the opening statement here, Okay? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while wind from God swept over the face of the waters. So what we're presented here is a blank canvas. You know, this is the foundation of, of really the church's teaching that creation is what? Creation is out of nothing. That out of nothingness, God speaks. God wills. And creation happens. Again, notice that first point from that ancient near Mid-Eastern text of creation. It was an unattended. Creation happened as a result of a battle between gods. But no, the God of Israel, God speaks, and then it comes into existence. God speaks, God intends. This is not an unintended, but a very intensive, intended consequence of God. There's no content. There's no form. There's chaos. Again, the, 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 the God of Israel is what? Is bringing order. And when you look at how creation is done in Genesis 1, you see what? You see order. You see poetry. You see rhythm. It's very beautifully, very beautifully given to us. And that word created comes from the Hebrew word, word bara. Okay, so in Hebrew, bara means creation, but it's only a word that's used and pertaining to God. Only God baras something. Again, the foundation of our understanding of creation from nothing. You know, and this is where those who study the physical science, this is where they go wrong. Because often they, they go back, they go back to the origins of the universe, and they start with something. Okay? The physical scientists... They start with something to show us that God doesn't exist, but it's from their lack of understanding of what really means, uh, what really mean creation out of nothing is. You know, yeah, there's, there's nothing, nothing except God, and God wills creation into existence. So notice the rhythmic pattern here. I'll read day one here, okay? And in the Hebrew, if you read Hebrew, it's, it, there's a lot more rhythm to it than, than it is in English. You know, remember, this is a translation, you know? So when we get to verse three, okay, in Genesis chapter one, God says, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. That's my translation. But notice this pattern here, okay? God speaks, and it happens. It was good. God separates. God names the conclusion. Okay, rhythm, order, 
Okay, this is not chaos. This is not a battle that's gone wrong. This is order. This is God bringing the universe, though, in a very orderly way. He speaks. It's good. God separates. God names. The conclusion. And this is going to happen for five more days. But notice even in that, okay, when we go to the next, next, uh, next little chart here, that days one and three and days four and six go together. In days one through three, you have the form, you have the arena that's being created. And in days four and six, those arenas are being filled with something. So in day one, it's light and darkness. In day two, it's sky and water. In day three, it's land. There, that's the form. That's the arena. But now it's going to be filled. So even in that, there's a pattern, a very rhythmic pattern. Because then day four, and, day four matches with day one. What fills light and darkness? The sun, moon, and the stars. In day two, the sky and the water. What fills that in day five? The fishes and the birds. In day three, the land. Well, what fills the land? vegetation, animals, and then eventually humans. So in days four to six, it's the content, the content that fills the form, that fills, as I like to call, the arena, okay? So again, very ordered, very structured. This is who God is. This is what the Hebrew people have given us, the revelation of God himself. God is not a chaotic God. Light, well, we're going to see why there's chaos. We're going to see that next week, what brings chaos. But in the beginning, in the beginning, it was not chaotic. In the beginning, it was very ordered because God is very ordered himself. Though on the sixth day, the pattern changes. Let's read that here quick. This is in verse 26 of chapter 1, if you have your Bibles out. So we just got done with the, 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 the beast and the cattle and so forth. Then in verse 26, we have a divine pause, a divine rupture. Something, something is different in this pattern. God breaks the pattern. And so when the pattern is broken, it kind of tells you that there's something unique and different about this next thing. So in verse 26... God says, let us, let us. Who's he talking about there, right? Let us. That's weird. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the things, over every creeping thing, even spider's mercy, okay, that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Notice male and female, he created them. Notice how he repeated that three times there. In the image, he created them. Male and female, he created them in his own image. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and every other living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that, that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he has made, and behold, it was very good. And that was the evening, and that was the morning, a sixth day. Notice how my translation, very different there. Let us, oh, here's the text right here. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. I forgot I put that on there. But that full first boiling point, let us, as Catholics, we see this as the preview of the Trinity. Now again, uh, uh, an ancient Jewish person reading that might have a different explanation as to why that is, but it still remain a mystery. Remember, really, what separated the Jews from all their neighbors was what? To believe in the, in the one true God, that there is one God who is Lord over all. 
Again, like I said, that creation story really brings that out, okay? Creation is not a result of multiple gods. It's a result of one God who through nothing brings things into existence. But then again, like I said, you have that kind of mysterious let us where, you know, you have rabbis for, for centuries and millenniums scratching their heads debating as to what exactly that means. But again, when, as Catholics, we can, and Christians really, we can read sacred scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ as the fullness of revelation. We can look back at that and say, okay, you know, the three persons and the one God, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, in fact, even John brings that out in the prologue in John chapter one. You know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. How can the word be both God and with God? Okay, well, that's the mystery. It's the mystery that we call the Trinity. If anybody wants to come on Thursday in RCA, uh, we're doing the Trinity. So I'll be down there, that's uh, downstairs. So if anybody's interested in more than welcome, um, you know, we have one, one adult and a couple younger people gonna be received into the church, but the, the one young person, very excited about it. So very, I can't wait for that. Image and likeness. If you look at the next bullet point, it's very common for ancient Near East emperors to place their image around the empire to represent their authority. Okay, so uh, you have maybe emperors in the Near East during the time where these, these books are given or given down to us. And it was common, whether it was on coins or on walls, work of arts, whatever, to see the image of the emperor. To want, for what purpose? To show that they are in charge. And so how does God, how does God do that? He does that through the human person. His authority is represented through the human person. The human person is the bearer of God's authority. It's been given to them. So notice again, all those instructions that, that God says that he gives authority, he gives dominion over the fish and the birds and so forth. That God has now bestowed his authority, has the, has the artist, has the creator, has now given his authority over to the human person who now bears that image, is now in the image of God. And again, we as, as Catholics can look back at the text now through the lens and eyes of Jesus Christ and through the teachings of the church. We can see that again and say, oh, male and female, he creates the human person not as one, but as two. Oh, back again to the Trinity, you know? Back again to the one God who creates in his image and his likeness. And as he creates in the image, he creates a male, he creates a female, and they come together and they create a third, you know, a third, and you name the third. Image, likeness, how's a human person like God? All oh, through their intellect and through their will, ability to will and to love. Those are essentially the two things that God does, <laughs> you know. God reasons and God wills, that's, that's all he has to do. Again, as the text points out so beautifully, all God has to do is speak and it comes into existence. All God has to do is will it, and it happens, you know. So each of you, again, are willed into existence by God, and God just doesn't do anything at random. You're not here by mistake. You're not here by choice. You are here because God has willed you into existence. He's given you a divine purpose. He's given you a purpose and mission in life. No matter how insignificant you feel it might be, Take it, you know, as you are doing this, not only for yourself, your families, but you're doing this for God. You're doing it for God. That's why you're here. And I don't mean here in this church, I mean just here. It's why you have a, you know, a self-awareness, a conscience, you know. More on that in just a bit. In Genesis chapter 5, 3, which we'll look at next week, we're going to see that Adam's sons are going to bear Adam's image and likeness. So I'll look at this very quickly here. Okay. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness and after his image and named him Seth. That's interesting. Again, the same. You always want to look when you read Scripture. Look for words that are being repeated, you know. So it's not done by accident that he says that Adam has a, a son in his image and likeness. So what does that say about Adam? 
Adam and Eve are created as what? As sons and daughters of God. Okay? To be created after the image and likeness, you're being created as like that son and daughter of that being. And look, our DNA tells us exactly that, right? We, we often look like our moms and dads, and often we often act like our moms and dads, and we use the same, same parental discipline that, that our parents used on, on, on us, you know, and, and the way they act is the way we act, and the same type of personality. Boys, isn't that funny? Isn't that something, you know? As we look at, you know, our own DNA line, how we look, we look like those that have come before us. You know, it's almost like we're created after their image and likeness. But again, the God of Israel wants to say what? Our God wants to say what? Yeah, you're created after my image, my likeness. You are a beloved son and daughter. So here, even though we don't have the words, we don't have that word implicitly what is being said here in Genesis chapter 1, that when male and female, we created them after his image and likeness, what do we have? We have a family being formed. We have a covenant being made. Okay, that word covenant again. God created the human person to enter into covenant with them. Because he created them after his image and likeness, he created them, really has a son and daughter by adoption. And then at the same time, what has given, he has bestowed his authority upon them, which again was also a central element of the covenant in the ancient Near East. Okay. Sonship by adoption, covenants established through adopted sonship. So again, in the ancient Near East, whenever you had this adopted sonship, you had this family being formed. Okay, a covenant was made to make that happen. Okay, and so, so it's happening here. Again, even though that word covenant never appears. And so again, in Genesis 1, Genesis, humans are sons and daughters rather than slaves. Okay, again, compared to that ancient text that we looked at. Okay, so that's a very radical difference. Humans are seen not as slaves, but as sons and daughters of God. That there's order in creation compared to the chaos and death of a battle. Again, some would say, again, in ancient Near East texts, creation happened through a battle amongst the gods, but not in the Hebrew text. And humans are created from the living God, not from a blood of a dead God. Okay. That's what Genesis 1 offers to the rest of the world you know, and really through all time. We don't see, we don't see texts like this, you know. You might have texts that might have some similar features to it, but the basic theological, philosophical message of Genesis, again, it's not concerned with the how, but the why. And also the result of the why. Why is created? God wishes what? To enter into covenant with the human person. That God brings order. And we, as we will see next week, we are the cause of the disorder in life. Are there any questions on anything that I said in Genesis chapter 1? Because I believe the next slide here... Oh, okay, we still have one more thing to get to. Did someone want to say something? I forget. I wasn't sure. Okay. The seventh day. Okay. Everything culminates on day seven. And notice... There are going to be strong, if we, if we looked at how creation happened in those first six days, we also have what we call a building of a temple, okay? When you get into 1 Kings, when you get into the completion of the temple, started by David, finished by Solomon, that temple was meant to, it was built in a way to represent the cosmos. The temple was built to, like, be an image of the universe because the idea is is that creation is one big large temple of god's dwelling place and even when they built the tent same thing sanctuary okay in the book of exodus they they, they build this this uh this sanctuary this tent for the ark of the covenant again the idea was what okay the idea was what to like mimic the universe mimic the cosmos 
And so all creation is one big, large temple building. Okay, so again, bullet point three suggests that creation, one big cosmic temple, and the earthly temple was built to resemble the seven days of creation. The seventh day, God rests. The seventh day is made for man. And what's the purpose? The seventh day is for worship. It's for covenant. Seventh day was meant to what? To enter into covenant with God. Okay. Our sole purpose in life, and maybe this is why we struggle in life. This is, this is my, I, mean, I mean, not only here, us here, I just mean people in general. Starting with Catholics and Christians. I would argue that maybe the most important thing that we do and what we're made for is to worship. And there's a lot of people not worshiping God. They're worshiping something. And maybe at times we worship something as well. Maybe there's something that we, we place, we give our lives to above God. But I would say that's the most fundamental struggle, and it's going to be the struggle of this whole Old Testament. When you go through from Exodus and all the way through First and Second Kings and Exodus and the prophets, it's all going to be centered around who are you going to worship. And if you are worshiping God, boy, you're not really putting your heart into it. Or boy, yeah, you worship God, but then you act contrary, you know, to the way that God is acting, you know, the way that God has, has asked us or commanded us to act, you know, in the covenant. But the idea, I think, central to our lives, and this is, I think, where we're so lost, we are created for covenant, we're created for worship. And we just don't know it. And we forgot so again, Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the book, it tells us that all creation is meant to what? All creation is pointed and oriented to what? To covenant with God. To be in relationship with Him. He is our Father. We has His beloved sons and daughters. That's why we're here. We're here because God wants us to be a part of His family. That glory of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through his mystery, and through his own divine will, he wishes to bring others into existence and for others to share in that love that God shares in each person of the Trinity with each other. I don't know why. I, honestly, I don't know why. But that's why. Go ahead. Yeah. For those that are watching on the internet, uh, the question is asked about the angels. What are their, where they're playing? We don't see much about the angels in in Genesis one or Genesis two. Okay, uh, the church does teach that the angels and all spiritual beings are also created by God through nothing. Okay, uh, in the spiritual world. There are angels, okay, the word angels means messenger. Uh, there are also demons, which at one point were messengers of God. They were, they were good in a sense. For whatever reason, through one radical choice, they decided to separate themselves from the life of God. Okay, unfortunately for the angels, and I can't get into detail why this is, uh, for those demons that did, that one choice that they made is not redeemable. It's like permanent. Okay, when you get into philosophy, when you talk about the spiritual life and the matter, the life of the spiritual, life of the matter, the physical, you know, there's, there's reasons for that. You know, but for us, we exist in time, so there's like this idea, this concept of redemption. Um, but yeah, uh, at some point, the, the angels, the spiritual life was created as well, okay? Um, though Genesis in the text doesn't get much into that believe it or not, because I don't think really Genesis 2 talks more about it anyways, um, and those sort of things. But yeah, there, there was a moment in history where the angels were not, right? Okay, so just like for us, there's a moment in time when we were not, and now we exist. Our souls will exist forever. Our church also teaches, our faith teaches, that our bodies will be reunited with our souls, our bodies will be patterned after the glorious resurrected body of Jesus Christ, resurrection to the dead. 
If you want to argue that point, you'll have to argue with St. Paul because that was a big part of his life, okay? Preaching about the resurrection of the dead. Um, but uh, the angels, the demons, they are pure spiritual beings. They don't have a body. They'll never have a body, okay? Okay, good question. Go ahead, Sharon. So just tagging on that, mm -hmm. would you say that it's within those that can take place? Yeah, I would... I, I would, um, I would make the assumption, so again, for those watching on the, on the internet, the uh, question is, would we assume that the spiritual life was within the, those first seven days? I would say yes, um, that God created, you know, in that span, okay, has presented to us in the six days, and I think we can make the assumption that everything, everything that exists, you know, is meant to be included in those six days, you know, um, and to say that something happened outside those six days would maybe make the assumption that it wasn't created by God. And I don't think the Hebrew writer would want to present that. Um, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And I guess one of the things to try to bring into all of that is that in the spiritual life, there's no time. Mm -hmm. time exactly. Time. Yeah. Yeah, t time is a very uh, mysterious concept, believe it or not. It's... Um, I once heard a great saying, you know, time is something we invented, and yet since we invented it, isn't it ironic that we never have enough of it, you know, right? You know what I mean? Like, it's uh, kind of funny, but also very deep in a sense of how we kind of live our lives, you know? We never have enough time for things, and yet we don't have enough of something that we created, you know? Um, time is a measurement of change. There's many definitions, and I'm sure people would, would disagree with that. But if you think about it, time measures change. That's one way of looking at it. You know, I am different yesterday than I am today. Different how? Well, I don't know, maybe a little bit older, a little bit grayer, a little bit fatter. You, you know what I mean? Like, my fingernails are slightly longer than they were yesterday. Um, more hair fell out, you know, those types of things. Um, but, but that's what time, you know, time is. You, you were born in a certain year, and now it's this year. What has changed? You know, what has changed? Hopefully, as us, as, as people, we hopefully not only do our bodies change, and our bodies get older, but hopefully just our character changes, and character changes for the good. You know, they, you always use the saying, um, you know, love, love yourself as you are right now. I disagree with that. Why? I think we should always, always seek, always desire to be a better version of ourselves every day. I mean, I, I'm not saying that to put us down and say we're terrible people. I'm just saying, I think, I think we can always be something better each and every day of what we are yesterday. You know, that's why I would disagree with that statement. You know, because we kind of just settle sometimes. And again, this is why life, we kind of lose meaning and purpose in life, you know? We, we lose purpose in life because, it, like, we're not, we're not aiming for something. We're just kind of moving along the day and doing our usual routine, but we, we don't realize that we're destined for something. And it's not really a physical place, but again, I think it's something more of the moral character and that's why I th uh, the, the moral character is especially where I should say, never, never just say, oh, I'm, I'm there. Always be like, yeah, tomorrow, let's be something better than we were today. Go ahead. The angel told God face to face. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 I'm just going to repeat for the camera again for those because they won't be able to hear your question. So, so go ahead. You can say the second one, and I'm going to repeat both of them. So, no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, say the second, the thing that you said there was a second thing. Yes. Yeah. The angel saw yeah. God face to face and knew, as we understand, exactly what he was, mm -hmm. the infallibility of him, and so on and so forth. How could I find it difficult personally, although I do believe it, because they had a free will, I do. But how was it possible? It's like just standing in front of your mother or father and saying, 
You're not there. You're not my mother or father. You don't exist. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I have a lot of arguments with people. Uh, and it's a rational, logical argument yeah. that they give me. Well, could there be life in other planets? Mm-hmm. Yes no. Many, many times. Yeah. No. Now, it's a rational and logical question that, of course, science believes in. Mm-hmm. Now, is there a possibility that among the billions or trillions of stars that there's another planet with human beings? Maybe they're all exactly like Yeah, so let's start, I'll start with the second one first. So pretty much to sum up, the, the second question is, you know, life, life on other galaxies, life, human life, that is, on other planets and so forth. They must have, if God created any yeah. other beings, they must have a soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They must have a soul. Yeah. What, then, of course, that opens up questions. Well, what was Christ only on Earth? Was he, I don't believe that there are any to make it Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. So, so yeah. So to um, to to talk about life on on other planets. First of all, it's it's not as like definitive as science would, would the scientists would say. You know, others are excited about the possibility. Others are like, well, probably not. Um, and one of the reasons is is they have not found anything. They have like a rating system. I don't know if it's one to 10, whatever it is, that would rate each planet as far as sustainable, a, 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 a place, a location, which would be sustainable to human life. They haven't found one even close to that, to, to one that would be, yeah, human life could, could exist, that type of thing. But to say that it is, um, well, first of all, the church doesn't say anything because it hasn't happened yet or, or hasn't been discovered yet, um, you know, those types of things. So the church will never give a definitive statement or teaching on something that they don't even know if it's even existing yet. Right? Does that make sense? Like, well, it does or it doesn't. You know, another possibility has no boundaries. Possibility is open. It's 50%. Yes, it could be. But okay. What is, what, how do you unite that with our spiritual belief, with God, with the church? I, I, I would... I, I would lean in the direction that the cross of Jesus Christ even applies to them. I really do. I really do believe that. You know, and that's just my personal opinion. It's not as if something, you know, that, that need, they need another Jesus on another planet or something like that. No, I would, I would argue that even, even they, you know, the salvation would even apply to them as well. The first question that you have, and I'll, and I'll quickly move on then, is, was about, well, uh, how, how, how can the angels who see God to face to face, how can they make that choice to, to go against him? One speculation in this, I don't have an answer to that question, you know, but one, one, possible, one possible answer to this is that when God presented these angels his idea of the Incarnation, that's when they turned because they could not believe that God would humiliate himself like that. You know? That, that God would do that. That God would, would become man. And that's, that's where the choice happened. Yeah. It won't be a mystery. We'll, we'll know the answer. Just not now. Patience. You know? Yeah. 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 Everything that we say about God, there's always going to be more. And isn't that, isn't that the beauty of it? Okay, let's look at quickly Genesis chapter 2. Okay. We're going to shift in perspective here. Okay, these two creation counts are not meant to contradict. 
They're not meant to go against each other. They're complementary, okay? From the cosmos to the creation of man, we're going to view both creation accounts as complementary, not competing. In the first creation story, God kind of took on this transcendent figure, right? God was this other being who, through his word, brings things into existence. But in the second creation story, we're going to see the, how God is imminent, how God is walking in the garden with Adam, how God is very close. And that's going to be the key. It's going to be the key to their failure that we'll see next week. God was so close. <laughs> Why did they fail? Well, guess what? God's close to us, and, and we fail too, believe it or not. Even me. All right. But we look at this person of Adam. You know, the stories are kind of different in Genesis 2. You know, in that day, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, no herb of the field has sprung up. God creates, in the second creation story, God creates the human person first. But again, it, it could be, there's different ways of looking at it, you know, um, where the two can, can seem to reconcile. I won't get into it, too much of it now. But, you know, like in the second creation story, the form is present, but it's not filled. And God begins with the human person. God breathes life into Adam. Where else do we see God breathing life? You should know this. No, you shouldn't, but I definitely know. I've, I say this all the time. Where else does God breathe on someone? John chapter 21, in the resurrection story, Jesus breathes on the apostles. It's the only other time God breathes on someone. Jesus breathes on the apostles, and he says what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. Eden, that famous place of Eden, we associate it with a garden, but it's not meant to be a garden. There is a garden, but Eden itself, its location, is supposed to be where it's, it's, it's on a mountain. How do we know that? Because the rivers, the rivers, there's four rivers that are mentioned in, let's say, let me quickly look it up for you. The rivers, verse 10? No, nope. so I'm looking at chapter 3, that's why. Yep, there you go. Verse 10, chapter 2, so sorry about that. It mentions those four rivers. The rivers... Again, rivers, if you don't know it, water flows kind of from top to bottom, all right? Just in case that you weren't familiar with that concept. So if something high, highly elevated, it flows down to a lower. It doesn't flow upwards, okay? It doesn't go up in attitude. It goes down. So we have these rivers going down from Eden. Eden is on a mountain. And so when we see the story of Moses, Moses... To meet God goes where? And Moses goes up the mountain. Then in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus goes up to the mountain to receive God's revelation. Oh wait, no he doesn't. Jesus goes up to the mountain. Jesus sits down, which was again a, a, a position of authority. And Jesus begins to teach from the mountain. Uh-oh. That's a divinity statement there. Only God teaches from a mountain. That's where God is. God's up there. He teaches. Jesus goes up to the mountain. He doesn't receive God's revelation. Jesus starts teaching. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the beginning of the Beatitudes. But Eden is also meant to be the original sanctuary of God. Again, just like chapter, just like chapter 1, first creation story, the cosmos is one big temple built in. And so in chapter 2, Eden is the sanctuary of God. It's, it's where God is because Adam is walking with God in the garden. And God, Adam is put to work. Adam works and guards the soil, just like the Levite priests were to work and guard the sanctuary. Okay? So we see Adam here acting as really the first priest, the first priest of God when he's tilling the soil and he's naming the animals and he's working. And again, it's no accident, back to John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene, she sees in this mysterious figure, she's crying, she, our Lord is gone. She meets this figure 
Who does she mistake the figure for? The gardener. Yeah. It's Jesus. She thinks it's the gardener. John's beautiful way of telling us that Jesus is the new Adam. And Adam is the mediator of the covenant between God and man. The work is the stipulations of the covenant agreement. The only prohibition, though, is not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. We'll look more at that next week. But then there's the creation, creation of Eve. Again, it's not good for man to be alone. There's this idea that in order for the human person to be created, there has to be not one but two. This idea of two, this idea, again, of two being in covenant. It's the only thing that makes sense to God. God's not like this, you know, isolated being. God God is a God in in a communion of persons. That's all he knows is covenant. That's all he knows is relationship. You know, that's that's, that's it. Everything is flowed from the relationship that God has in in those persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's not right. There's more to be done. Okay, so again, when you read that in Genesis chapter 2, it's not as if, again, God made a mistake. The, the idea is, is it's, it's not right in the idea of incompletion. There's more to be done. And so God puts Adam in a deep sleep, back to pre-creation, back to, like, to a moment of non existent And then when Adam wakes up, he sees wife, Eve, He uses covenant language, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, declaring Eve to be his wife with the explanation of marriage. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And so very important here that the covenant marriage that we experience, well, not me personally, but you, covenant marriage is meant to be a sign of the covenant between God and humanity. You know, it comes. It's an image. It comes from God's covenant relationship with the rest of us. And so we'll end with this. We'll end with just a preview for next week. You know, if God used order to create the universe, then why is there so much disorder? We're going to look at that. We're going to look at the fall and its consequence on humanity. We're going to see how this joyful explanation, this joyful excitement of Adam upon seeing his helper, to see his helpmate, to see this beautiful, again, covenant relationship between Adam and Eve to be a beautiful sign of God with, with them, how the two kind of flow together. We're going to see how that's disordered and why we are such messed up people. <laughs> you know, yeah, I just had a thought, I was just in prayer beforehand. You know, from, if I take these couple pages here, Marcy, you can, you can get out of the PowerPoint there. You know, like, so, so right here, these two pages in my Bible, and then maybe you get to, like, the last page here in, Je- in Revelation, because Revelation also ends with a marriage, you know, God's marriage with the human race, that's how Revelation ends, there'll be no more tears, no more wailing, you know, so this, this one page here is good, and this page here is good, but the rest of this, <laughs> this is very messy, very chaotic, just like our lives, you know. But, um, but we, we can get to here. We can. It's what God wants the most in life, you know. So his, his greatest desire is to get us here, to get us into covenant. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask again, for us to enter into this covenant uh, love that you have with us. Help us to remind us, we ask you to help us, help us to know our purpose, our mission in life. Help us to know know that we exist, first and foremost, um, to enter a relationship with you. Help us to know that and to believe it and to understand it. We ask your blessing upon us, upon our families, and upon all who are here, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and reign with you forever. Amen. All right. God bless. Go in peace.